Welcome to the town hall with the staff advisors to the regions. Um, Luana Richmond and Jason Valdry are here today to present their role as staff advisors to the regions and to hear and um, to share initiatives that are important to staff um, and what the regions are doing and they, how they plan to support all of you as UC staff members. Um, so Dr. Luana Richmond serves as the staff advisor to the regions of the University of California and is a senior analyst at UC San Diego where her responsibilities include project management and professional development for staff. Um, Dr. Richmond is a certified project management professional with degrees in marketing, operations, information systems, and educational leadership. Over the past 20 years, Luana has been actively involved in community service and social justice endeavors. And Jason Valdry joined UC Irvine in 1998 and is currently the Director of Technology of the UC Irvine Claire Trevor School of the Arts. In his role, Jason oversees web servers, databases, technical support, the multimedia library, and provides research support to faculty and students. Over the past 18 years, Jason has focused service, his, on service to his campus community, including working with UC Irvine Staff Assembly and the Council of University of California Staff Assemblies. So now we, ho we hope that this will be an interactive discussion, so please don't be shy in speaking up. And please join me in welcoming Luan and Jason. So before we get started, how many of you are familiar with the staff advisor to the regions role? Show of hands. You can just shake your hand. Okay. All right. So I just want to make sure we're going to bore you with like a bunch of details that you are in. Um, so just to give you some background, it was initially um, proposed by Bob Dine. So I'll leave the facts up there, and I'll tell you a little bit of the backstory. Um, prior to it being proposed, um, the Council of the University of California Staff Assemblies um, had been lobbying to try to get a staff regent position created, and um, in order to change the composition of the Board of Regents, it's a constitutional act. That means you have to amend the Constitution of the State of California. So rather than try to fight that battle, the compromise was to create a staff advisor role, and it's a non-voting role. Um, President Tulane is selected, so they launched the pilot. The regents voted to, okay, we'll give it a try and see if they're, you know, make sure they're not going to come in and be disruptive to meetings and see if they're adding anything of value. And after two years, they voted unanimously to establish the positions. And I want to add that one of the first two staff advisors to the regents was um, here from UCLA, um, and he's still very engaged. Um, and we do stagger two year turns. And um, from the standpoint of why we think you should consider applying for this role, um, in terms of the opportunities, um, it's a way to ensure that you know perspectives are, are at the table. But it's also you get to work on political acumen and negotiating skills, and gain an understanding of the process and priorities. So you get to understand the organization and see it from a very unique perspective. Instead of just seeing it from a staff perspective or just from a leadership perspective, um, the staff advisors are we're in one of the few positions where we get to see like the ground level perspective and leadership at the campus level as well as at the system level. You get to visit and learn about the people at other campuses. We get to spend time with people like you and learn about best practices, concerns. We visit each of the campuses um, to make sure that, you know, whatever we say, it's not just what we think, it's also what you guys think. So that we're hoping this will be an interactive session so we can have some thoughts to include in our inventory of information. And you get to join a lead group of staff members who have been selected and served in the role. Uh, not to mention you get some cool jewelry and a nice little name for you. <laughs> and you actually get to sit at the table, and that, that, that table, that picture kind of does it justice. It, it, it is a little intimidating, but it is uh, also quite an opportunity. And so we are encouraging people to, to look at it and consider uh, serving the campus and the system in a different way. The application period will be opening within a couple of months, so I think it's open every January. Yes, January and February. And you can go online now to the Staff Advisor website and actually look at the application that's there. It doesn't typically change much from year to year, it's just that the period 
is um, it's a finite period when they're open, kind of like admissions. Um, in terms of description of duties, um, bi-monthly regents meetings, so those meetings are two days. Um, Pre-regents meetings with the president, so before every regents meeting, there's a meeting with the president, and we go to quarterly CUSA meetings. We do campus visits, kind of like here today, which are they're a series of back-to-back -back meetings. Our first meeting this morning was at 8.30, and we're scheduled to, all the way up to 4 p.m. Um, we had, our break was a working lunch. <laughs> And we are um, volunteered to serve on task forces and working groups. Um, for example, Hey Family Compatible League, which is a new uh, workforce uh, work group that uh, I'm serving on. And our first meeting is in oh, two weeks. And at the moment, I don't know what it's going to be about other than the topic of the work group uh, and looking at uh, a different type of lead to support staff. So hopefully I will be uh, adding that to our upcoming newsletter and you can read about it as I learn about it. And what's at the bottom of every UC job card? <laughs> other than the other So the Regents meetings happen every month. They happen every other month. Um, they, if it's an odd number month, there's a Regents meeting that month. They typically happen at UCSF or in an alternate location. They're two days plus some off cycle meetings. The investment subcommittee meeting typically happens here at UCLA. They're open to all staff, so you are actually to the public. So if you're interested, you want to see, you can sit in the back and get us view just like that one and see and listen. And generally, there's an option for public comment. And the regents do want to hear from you. They want to hear from what people what people think. We're there to represent the staff perspective, but they also care what the general population of California thinks. Well, the words not really represent. We're here to share the staff That's perspective. Right. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> and then we attend receptions and dinners. And I would say our most substantive interaction with the regents is around food or coffee. <laughs> 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 Because during the time at the meeting, it's very focused, it's a very formal process, and we can comment on anything, but in terms of actually having meaningful interaction, it's typically in less formal settings. Um, we have nice chats on the shuttle, too. <laughs> um, there's a link at the bottom of this if any of you are interested in seeing a Regents meeting. They're all live streamed as they're happening, but then they are also recorded, so you can Go and see the Regents meeting from 2007 if you'd like. <laughs> and you can kind of see kind of how the process goes, how the discussion goes. And um, the public comment, you know, we can't stress enough to take advantage of the opportunity for public comment. And, you know, I would even go so far as to say, don't just make comments when you're mad. <laughs> um, it's just like any other relationship. If the only time I hear from you is when you're angry and you have a problem, then you're going to become become synonymous with anger and problem. So when I see you coming, I'm automatically going to expect like trouble. But if you also, or if they also hear from staff about things that are going well, or things that we like, or things that we appreciate, it can kind of balance it out and make the relationship be more, um, have a little bit more texture to it. So it's not just one note. I mean, can you imagine somebody coming into a room and hitting a piano and just hitting that one note? Every, you know, just hitting the note. <laughs> That's all you hear. Um, it's just not as interesting. Sure. So we also have the opportunity to meet one on one, two, <laughs> two on two, with, two, on two <laughs> with uh, President Jen Paulcana uh, every month that there's a regents meeting. So in preparation. Real month, though, depending on her schedule. Apparently, it's busy. So it's just prior to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so we uh, set the agenda. We look at the issues that that we think are relevant, and how do we do that? We listen to you. We hear what you have to say, and tell us what's important to bring to her attention. And she then, in turn, informs us uh, what's going on um, or what's likely to happen at the Regents meeting, uh, and then hopefully it gives us some time to come back and ask questions and gather some consensus of what you think on some of this. 
And every meeting, you know, we did mention that it's two on two. So there's the two, there's a staff advisor, staff advisor designate, um, the president, and then she also has her deputy chief of staff in the room. And he kind of makes a to-do list. So like as we're talking to her about different things, if there's something that requires follow-up or future action, um, he is typically the person that kind of drives that and helps us to move things forward. One thing I think I sure. Um, so I just want to make sure. So Luana is the staff advisor, and we serve staggered terms. I know you covered that, but I'm the staff advisor president, so she's teaching me everything right now. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, any mistake that he makes is my fault. It means yes, that I wasn't, I wasn't as good of a teacher as I may have thought I was. So I'm trying. I mean, and he is a he's a great student. I mean, when I found out that Jason was going to be my designate, I was really happy because he was from the same Cooksa cohort. Does everyone even know what Cooksa is? The Council of UC Staff Assemblies. So every staff, every campus, uh, and every location to be more specific, including uh, UCSF, the Office of the President, and ANR, the Agricultural and Natural Resources Division of UC, also has representatives that come and meet quarterly. And they discuss the issues and help inform us about what we need to bring forward to the regions. And they work on uh, issues and have uh, work groups that write reports, and they present also to the regions at the end of the uh, fiscal year. They so actually get to present to the regions. We just get to talk. To them. <laughs> and you guys have, are fortunate enough to actually have the chair and the secretary of CUCSA here on your campus. And they're both in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and and I've you know, been really pleased with the interaction here at your campus. Um, so if you don't want to apply to be a staff advisor, maybe consider serving as a delegate. Um, again, you have an opportunity to impact policy and the environment for your colleagues and yourself. Now the campus visits are scheduled with the local campus chancellor's office and staff assembly. And we spend the day meeting with the president, with different staff groups. This morning we met with um, some early, early career professionals. We met with some leadership from your AMG group and your staff assembly. And now we're here to talk to you because, you know, and I'm going to try to get through this because I don't want to do all the talking. I would really love to hear from some of you. You can ask us anything. Tell us anything. We're there, no judgment <laughs> because we're all staff at the end of the day. Um, these are some of the local campus stakeholders that we meet with, and the campus visits we have for the year. Last year, I visited five locations. Um, this year, we've got to go to a few more. <laughs> <laughs> And some of the current UC issues, um, the state budget, because you know it's not like we wait until it's time for them to vote on the budget and say, hey, this is what we want. We start that process early as an institution. And one of the things that's been happening is that um, the regents have asked each of the individual campuses to actually present financial information so that they have a really good picture of like where we stand as a system, each institution does. Um, they've created a new um, debt policy to kind of try to, you know, make sure the ship kind of stays stable and manages the course. Um, student housing, the president launched a student housing initiative this year because, you know, how many of you are aware of the enrollment increase? Okay, how many of you are feeling the enrollment increase? <laughs> so, I mean, with that being the case, I mean, one of the, one of the things about the enrollment increase is that there are more people to house. Um, and, you know, we all know there's 100% housing is kind of a, yeah, but at least, you know, try to get as many housing for as many students as possible. Sexual violence, sexual assault, and, you know, for those of you who think that it's just a UC issue and it's limited to whatever campuses have had problems, it's a national, it's a national issue. It's not, it's not about UC or any other individual institution, it's about people. I mean, it's in every industry, and you know, personally, I'm glad that it's something that our system is taking on and trying to find meaningful ways to address and reduce. And one of the task force that has become an advisory group was on sexual violence and sexual assault, and there's been a lot of work done in the last year to try to um, 
address some of the policy issues because one of the things that happened when everybody started looking at it, there was a policy depending upon like which bargaining unit you were in, whether you were faculty or staff or a lecturer or a student or um, what your role was. And so for a person trying to navigate through that, whether they were a complainant or a respondent, that like maze of policies meant that people weren't really, um, they weren't necessarily being served in the best way. And one of the things that came up in the discussion is that, um, so people often focus on the um, complainant's um, perspective. But you know, we live in a country where people are innocent until they're proven guilty. So we also need to um, be sensitive to the needs and perspective of the person who's responding to the complaint. And so there have been policies put in place to try and make it a more sensitive process so that um, you know, as uncomfortable as it is of a situation, you know, it's it, you know, to make it the best possible case. Um, abusive conduct, abusive conduct guidance has been issued. Com campuses have been um, directed to develop um, anti-bullying policies and distribute them. And I spoke with their chancellor this morning. He said that it's been done, and so bully be gone, right? <laughs> um, diversity and engagement is an ongoing issue, and it's. You know, it's diversity and engagement across the board. We've got faculty, staff, students, we've got alumni, we've got community. There are a lot of different ways that as a system or as individual campuses, we touch people's lives. And, you know, being equitable in how we do that is nice. And of course, innovation. You know, we're a system that's built on innovation and we thrive on continuous improvement. And as we mentioned earlier, paid family leave has um, made its way to the agenda about a year ago. Um, it was on our agenda with the president because we realized that it was something that staff didn't have and really wanted. <laughs> there were several people who expressed an interest. And now it looks like, you know, thanks to our legislators, it, it's going to happen. So that's kind of a nutshell of the role, what we focus on, what we do. Um, these are some ways to contact us. Um, every now and then we tweet. <laughs> um, we have a website where there's actually a place where you can subscribe to our newsletter. I would like to say it comes out quarterly, but eh. well, um, <laughs> still Yeah, because all of our staff advisor activity is on our regular job card and it's part of that other duties as a sign. None of our other duties, our real duties, um, got like delegated or taken away from us. Um, of course, you can email us, and we welcome your feedback. Um, again, I'm hoping that you guys will be very vocal. I hope I haven't put you to sleep. I hope Jason hasn't put you to sleep. <laughs> and um, with that, I'd just like to open it up for questions. So I'm um, not really sure what your process is here. If you guys want to just like raise your hand, stand up. Um, yeah. I'm just curious what you've been focusing on most recently. I think uh, most recently it's been uh, sexual violence, sexual assault, uh, and I think new this year we're starting to look at uh, wellness, and particularly mental wellness, and uh, uh, an effort to try and take on something that sort of mental first aid, if you will, to look at how do you prevent uh, a stressful situation from becoming a depressive episode? And what kind of basic training can <clears throat> staff be given uh, that can you know, apply the band-aid to that mental health issue before it becomes an issue? Right. Uh, of course. <laughs> so wellness actually, um, last year, how many of you are familiar with the Optum, like you do the assessment, do all this stuff, and you get like a gift card or something? Um, so last year they looked at that, they looked at how much money was being spent to do that. <laughs> and the ROI just didn't really make sense. So it's like, how can we look at wellness in a way where we can impact more people in a broader way? And so there was a committee that included people from different campuses, from different um, walks of life. So you had, well, you had, um, what is it? Life work balance, work life balance. You had people from work-life balance, you had um, some HR people, you had benefits people, you had cooks of people, you had staff advisors, um, all get together 
and talk about, and there are people from risk management as well, talk about how um, how can we best serve our staff in a meaningful way, as opposed to, you know, you jump through for hoops and you get a carrot. Um, and so we start talking about wellness in a much more comprehensive way. So instead of only looking at, you know, what is your physical health like, we started looking at it and expanding it to look at the whole person. And within that, I developed a strong interest in mental wellness because, um, you know, as a man thinking, so he is. And, you know, if we are able to manage stress effectively and just kind of, if you keep your mind right, then you're better, you're in a better position to deal with any other challenges, whether they're work, whether they're life, whether it's physical, mental, whatever's going on. And one of the things that happened is I found about a, a national campaign to make mental health first aid as readily available as CPR or physical first aid. And the idea behind mental, first, mental health first aid is that, you know, it's kind of like a triage approach. You're not being asked to serve as a counselor or a therapist, but it's just to be able to recognize signs in your colleagues because there's, like, there's two kinds of situations. There's the crisis where it's a clear crisis, something catastrophic has happened and people are dealing with that emotionally. But then there's that slow boil thing too. And as a person in the workplace, you're probably you spend more time with your coworkers than their family does. And so you're probably gonna recognize behavioral changes more quickly than other people and maybe be able to comfort that person or help connect them with resources so that um, it doesn't become a crisis situation. And you know, I really felt like it's important to emphasize that because it's like, it's just a small piece of it because we have faculty, staff assistance, employee assistance programs, and, We've got a lot of different things in place. We've got insurance for um, behavioral health, but a lot of people aren't taking advantage of those resources. And sometimes they just need a little support. And quite often your colleague will trust you more than they will trust some stranger um, in the, when they're in a time of need or difficulty. I think one uh, another issue that is on our radar is uh, supervisor training. I think it's something that we're aware of that we need to look at broadly and see what, where are the areas that we can help supervisors uh, be better at promoting professional development for their staff and uh, encouraging it for themselves because to be a good supervisor, you have to can do, your, do continuing education yourself. As an institution of higher education, we, we really should be focused on that for ourselves as well as for the students. And so with the supervisor training, it's been an issue that has been, it's it's been raised for years. You know, staff have said, hey, you know, can can you train our supervisors so that they know how to treat people? Because um, quite often the strategy has been um, to promote subject matter experts. You know, you, you're a really good accountant, so now I'm going to promote you to a leadership position where you're responsible for other people, their productivity, and their careers. Because you're a good accountant. And you know, there's some accountants that have really good people skills. Um, but we can't assume that because someone can count well that they can also communicate well. Or well. And so that but that complaint has been echoing down the halls at you know campuses and and OP, but there's traction now. Um, at the system-wide level, they're looking at um, creating some more um, more high-touch um, interaction with potential and actual supervisors who are to provide them with some resources to help them when it's time to make some of those more difficult communications. Because some people, they just avoid rather than tell. So if you have an employee who's not doing well, rather than tell them that they're not doing well, you give them an exceptional performance appraisal and then you might complain about them and treat them back. Um, and then at the campus level, um, like we've met with your um, chief human resource officer and the chancellor, one of the things that's happening is they're requiring that people actually get some people management training if they want to be supervisors. Um, so there's traction. So it, it's not, it's beyond just looking at it, it's actually, there's some light. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, my question. Uh, going on to that topic, uh, 
you know, the faculty can also be supervisors, we report to them as well. Is there anything that can be done as well, talking about supervising and training mm -hmm. faculty to have those skills and be, be aware of that as well? We brought that up with Justin Block this morning when we met with him. And it was something that he, he recognized, and, and your EDC he as well, uh, that, uh, that there's a challenge there. And that when a, when a faculty member goes from being a faculty member, as if that wasn't hard enough, then they go to being a supervisor. And suddenly, they're thrust into a role as a chair, a department head, uh, a lab uh, supervisor, a uh, PI, whatever it is, they end up with a staff member reporting to them. And suddenly, they're in charge of your professional development. And they recognize that there's a challenge there. It's, it's not an easy answer because a lot of the training, uh, and I'll want to add to that, that their training is not uh, the same as, uh, as a professional manager. So it, it's, it's a challenge that they're aware of and that we're looking at. Juan wants to add to this. So how many of you are familiar with um, the shared governance model? <laughs> So um, in order to really get traction in that particular area, we're going to need the support of the Academic Senate. Mm -hmm. um, and so... <laughs> I, am not, I, am, I am not saying it's impossible. What I'm saying is it's, it's something that's being considered and looked at. And, and, you know, with everything, it's like understanding what is the... What is the how do you approach handling this? And um, one of the things that um, was shared with us um, at one point by someone was, if you ask a faculty member who their supervisor is, <laughs> so if, if, if you can't get a, a, you know, a, a straight answer to that one, um, then it's hard to you know, build in that accountability in that way. So what we're talking about is actually a culture shift. And so I don't think it's impossible. I think it's doable. I just think that it's something that is a longer journey and um, you know I think being able to at least get it on the administrative side is a step in the right direction and can help to shape a culture where the expectation is that supervisors will um, you know consider supervision of something that you actually have to put some thought into um, you know one of the things you know this is in defense of all supervisors when you have a subject matter expert who's promoted to a supervisor, it's typically because there's that's the way to get them a raise, right? And the supervisor part is like added to whatever their job already was. And like maybe they're allocated like five, if that, percent of their time to actually supervise. Or maybe it's juggled a little bit, but it's not like they're given 20 or 30% of their time to just focus on supervision. And you know, if the expectation in terms of what they're supposed to um, put out from a, pro a productivity standpoint is that you know they're going to do this other thing, and supervision is part of your other duties as assigned, it's going to be treated that way. I have a couple questions. One is um, I get the president's newsletter now, and Anne says, "Oh, if you have a comment, send it to us." And then you send them a comment that says, "Oh, you know, she can't actually answer this." But thanks for your comment. So you that's the reply, auto reply. And I want to know, I have sent her a couple compelling comments, and I know she's not going to read it, but somebody on her staff should be commenting when you ask us to actually comment when the newsletter comes out. I actually take time to read it. And then when I comment, I don't get any feedback. Number one. Number two, you see PATH had to have been approved by the regents because we bought a building. So they knew we were going to do it. And we, staff are affected because the original plan was you're going to have all these salary savings or getting rid of staff because you won't need so many people to do the process. But now we have come full circle and you're going to need everybody who was here who was going to save money is still going to need to be here. We'll, we'll still have staff, but we have no way to pay for the UC PATH system. What are they saying about that? We're going to be taxed. How is that going to end up impacting staff? Because the bottom line is, they don't get rid of faculty, but they sure in heck do get rid of staff. 
So when they don't have enough money to pay the bills, they're going to say, oh, it looks like we're going to have to leave some staff people off. What's happening with that at your level? <laughs> is to be a more efficient organization, mm -hmm. to save money. Because we, the system does not add value by having 10 different payroll systems mm -hmm. and doing things 30 different ways. And the challenge in investing that kind of money is you have to be able to identify where that money is going to come from. And so they, they came up with that proposition. I'm not saying that it's going to happen that way, because the reality is where we're going to save money is in cost avoidance. So we're not necessarily going to save money by laying somebody off. That may happen, but that may happen for other reasons. But when we save money by not spending money in the future, that's where it's going to realize. And so I think my honest opinion, speaking purely for myself in this one, I think they went with UC Path because we know that we have an inefficient system. We don't know exactly how to extract that inefficiency into real dollars. So they make a case, a business case, that makes sense on paper. But I don't think anyone in this room would argue that we can be inefficient in our payroll system. When we have multiple different ways of doing it, you get paid your one way in your department, I get paid a different way. I can do payroll deduction for donating to the university and for my parking permit. And those are all different on every campus. So if we can come up with a single system, there is efficiencies there. Sorry, I made correct, sorry. There are efficiencies there. <laughs> and so uh, it's not going to happen exactly the way that they played out in the beginning. I, that's my honest answer. Uh, how is it going to work? I can't answer that for you. I think we will see the efficiencies when it's complete, because I believe we are an efficient organization when it comes to HR at the moment. So I know that's not the answer you're looking for, and yes, staff may get laid off. I don't believe that they're going to go out and actively try and find whatever UC path costs in terms of uh, staff layoffs and say, okay, we have to save $50 million from this project, and now we need to lay off how many other staff that is, a ridiculous quantity. Um, but we will avoid costs in the future by having a simpler process that does not have these crazy customizations that have come up from an IT system that was built 30 years ago. So I'm not, I know that doesn't answer, you're not happy. No, you're not happy that's the answer. same thing all of the managers always tell me the same. But the reality is no. It's good to have a good same same system. But, they, okay, they but sold were it. staff people consulted when they decided to buy that building? No, they bought the building and they said we're going to do this. And we had to get on board. That's my, my point is that do staff all, are we really heard if we're not asked in the first place? I, I think that's one of the reasons why this role exists, is to hear what you're saying and try to convey that back to leadership and get the answer for you. I don't have the answer, yeah. but we can help convey that question that the message has not been heard. Okay, thank you. And your first question was on, uh, sorry, refresh my memory. I don't know. Okay, so so there's a couple of things. Um, I can appreciate your experience because you know I don't. It happened. I, I can say that there have been times when I've sent emails. This is way before I was in the staff advisor role, and they got responded to. I'm not really. You know, there's. There's inefficiencies in our systems across the board, but what what we you know, if we want to stay in scope, if there's a comment, a concern, a question, an interest that you would like to share, 
one of your avenues for making sure that it gets communicated to and hopefully there's some type of response would be to reach out to us. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that that one of the things that we will do is when we hear things from you, if you tell us something, we're going to take that as part of our message back to the regions. But I'm not guaranteeing to you or to anyone that I'm going to say exactly what you wanted me to say. <laughs> <laughs> But until it becomes a theme, when I when we hear that from everyone, when we hear that uh, parking, we don't like paying for parking. We're going to convey that message. Well, that's everybody. They like to pay for parking. And so I think uh, the point is, we hear we hear you, and we'll do our best to convey that. The other part, and this is really important, and. Um, and I think anybody that works here and is part of, you know, just process, um, it's important to make sure that your message is going to the person that can actually do something about it. Yeah. For example, your concern about not getting a response to your comments. Um, I don't know how much how much traction we would get going to the regions and saying, well, you know, we're at UCLA. <laughs> But what we can do, if we know like what those concerns are specifically, is you know depending on what they're related to, we may be able to speak to the vice president or person who's in charge of the area that directly impacts that, and who's actually probably um, in a better position to direct us to the person who has the actual answer to the question. So I mean that's that's a strategy. It's kind of like you know someone calls the library to ask for how to process their travel vouchers. Um, <laughs> it happens. I mean, there are people, they find a, one staff person that they feel is helpful, and they will call that person about their travel, their, their extramural funds, their payroll questions. <laughs> so, I mean, I know, but I hear you and I feel you, because there's nothing like, you know, reaching out, making, taking the time to, you know, come up with a message and feel like it hasn't been received or responded to. So with that, you know, the, the thing we do have control over is us receiving and responding. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples of significant impacts that you've had with policies or anything affecting staff in the past? Well, there, you know, so how many of you were here back when furloughs happened? Okay, do you remember all the correspondence that went around, like how it was going to be implemented? You know, there were a few different like flavors and versions of how it was going to play out. Um, the way that it finally did end up being played out, I think it was done in a way where it would harm the least of us the least. And I believe that that was directly related um, to the involvement of the staff advisors at that time taking a really active role and an active voice and talking about how it's going to impact people because you know depending upon what your situation is even you know what some would consider a nominal percentage of your salary not making its way to your pocket um, could significantly impact your ability to meet your obligations and maintain your standard of living and so I can I can attest to that that's one example um, another example could be um, recently the abusive conduct policy. Um, there was, you know, it wasn't, um, there wasn't a policy. So if, if you were being, experiencing egregious conduct from your like supervisor or whoever, and it wasn't of a sexual nature, well, you know, it's your problem. There's no policy about it. So, you know, if you don't like it, you know, as long as they didn't you know, break any laws. <laughs> um, and so to, to have it as a policy makes it more actionable. And it also sends a message that, you know, it's not okay to hit your admin on the head with a file folder. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, those are a couple of examples. Some of it is a little bit, um, probably a little bit more subtle, just um, for example, with the, um, you know, when they're talking about um, building new buildings, you know, being in the room to say, you know, please, you know, make sure that you're including space for staff. You know, it's just kind of elevating um, things that we think about to the level of, you know, consideration so that it's part of the plan instead of an afterthought. 
Um, because, you know, honestly, after, you know, for example, with the building, once they've started building the building, um, you know, they can make some adjustments or some edits, but pretty much it's, it's going to be what it is. Um, in terms of UC Path, I, I do want to, I always, whenever UC Path comes up, I always feel like I need to remind people that, like, at the UC Path Center, um, there are people who work there who are our colleagues, and they really want to do a good job. When I visited the UC Path Center last year, they were really concerned about, you know, what are people saying about us? Do they understand? You know, they were nervous about their go live day. And, you know, the project has experienced some challenges. And a big part of it is that, you know, the UC system is a monster. It's complex. There's, you know, there's a degree of complexity that people who come from the outside um, can't even begin to understand until they actually start digging in. And in terms of the project itself, um, you know, the way it was presented may have not necessarily been the, it could have been presented in a different way because the reality is we're using legacy systems that are, you know, eventually not going to serve us well. And from how many people in the room are in compliance and audit involved in some way where you have to do a report or respond to a request for information to make sure that you're operating in a way that complies with either state, federal, local, exactly. And so from a compliance and audit standpoint, having all these legacy systems, when there's a request for information at the OP level for system-wide information, having all these disparate systems makes it really difficult to respond in a timely manner. So just from a sense of like how we do business and what we're supposed to represent when we say we're a cutting edge organization, um, the, the, the current state is not in our best interest. The way that it was presented didn't necessarily focus on that, but um, the reality is the legacy systems were not going to continue to meet our needs. And stop, in fact, they had stopped meeting our needs. Any other questions? How do you guys deal with ongoing topics? Like, I'm sure budget is a new topic every year at this point in time. How do you guys make those discussions? Baby you know, steps. Relevant <laughs> There are many ongoing, ongoing topics that we bring to the table as well. I mean, you know, budget, you know, money is always going to be a, a matter of a topic, and it's it's just paying attention because, like the ongoing topics, it's important to not let them become a steady hum. Um, because, you know, like in the same way that that one note, you don't want to listen to it. But the reality is, for example, open enrollment. <laughs> um, we have open enrollment every year, right? This year, open enrollment is a little bit different. And it's really important that we don't say, oh, it's just another open enrollment period and just check the boxes and check out because the options are different. There are opportunities to um, make some changes and to um, take advantage of benefits that are typically only available during your initial, your initial period of eligibility. And so it's really important, ongoing topics, to just pay attention and to remember that even though you know, it could easily become housekeeping, we need to just be cognizant and be alert because you, know, you never know. There may be a benefit that you really wanted and you weren't paying attention and you didn't get it. Or something that changed, and because you weren't paying attention, you got defaulted into an option that cost you a whole lot more money than you actually wanted to pay. And because it's not one that you get to change, you're stuck with it. So that's my um, metaphor for the budget conversation. <laughs> I just want to have a question about vacation time. What, what I've kind of noticed is in the US, many American workers are not taking their vacation. I kind of think it's happening here too, and I see people that have this enormous responsibility. There's no backup, and their their vacation becomes when they're actually too sick to work because they're coughing and they've got the flu. And I'm kind of wondering where you're at with that. One thing that's happened on this campus is we close in December, and that's like a forced vacation, and we kind of seems all kind of honor that. And there's not a lot of emails. Can you fix this? Can you fix that? But it's an odd way to handle. What's supposed to be a time of regeneration, I guess. No, go ahead. I'm going to talk about um, 
one of the things that uh, has, has come to my attention recently and something that we talked about uh, a little while ago was that uh, catastrophic lead banks, the ones that, can't, that do have them, uh, is something that you have to manually uh, give to. So it, it's a concern of mine, and I think the one as ours, that when you have vacation time, that first off it goes to waste if you get if you hit the limit. That just for your if you haven't done the math, that's a third of a percent of your salary if you did you lose your vacation day. So um, we don't recommend losing a vacation day. We strongly recommend taking your vacation unless you're fine with that kind of pay cut. But uh, so first take your vacation because as employees of the university. We need you to be here tomorrow and the next day and the day after. So if you don't take it, you're going to get sick or you're going to have to get it. Uh, it's, the, the, there is a real challenge there. We have this pressure that some people don't feel that they can take it until they're so sick that they can. My view has been that, uh, as I said, it's a third of a percent of a pay cut. It's, 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 it's insane that anyone would actually lose vacation time. Uh, so I don't think it's something you should do. And I encourage my staff very strongly, take your time, don't max out. Uh, but something we talked about briefly, I'll turn it over to one last second, is uh, perhaps there's something that we can do, some way that we can look at, at least not letting that go to waste. We have staff that have serious issues and they don't have any lead. And the stigma of necessarily giving it to one person when you have it probably isn't enough. If there was a way to capture that loss vacation, at least that would be going to something meaningful rather than simply letting it go to waste. I don't know that that's in the works. It's just something that we've talked about. But um, I, uh, it is an issue. We're aware of it. I don't want to add to that. I also think it's a leadership issue. And I say that because as a supervisor, if you really want your staff to be their best, you're gonna encourage them to take some time to sharpen the saw. Um, in the same, supervisors know when their staff are close to max. And, you know, the reality is, the, this institution is how old? Almost oh, so, and it, it was here before any of us got here. And it's going to be here after any of us leave. And I am not telling people to be irresponsible or to be slackers, but um, if you want to talk about wellness, um, one of the ways to like experience some mental challenges is to just keep winding and winding and winding and never taking the time to unwind. That's how people stop. So, I mean, from a, from a leadership standpoint, I would rather have people taking vacation and being fresh and enthusiastic and happy than not taking vacations and being miserable and making errors that are a result of them being burned out. Thank you for your time. Um, I encourage the opportunity to ask questions. Um, I know you have a busy day, so yeah, thank you again. I do have one. Uh, not a, an issue that's just bubbling up now, it's uh, food security. So mm -hmm. we've been to Regents meetings regularly, and the, the students have been talking about it. Within the study. There's an article just yesterday regarding the study. So I'm curious um, if you all have talked about it and strategize. We haven't um, talked about it. I did read the study. Um, at some point, he and I will actually. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 but you know, interestingly, um, when having a discussion about food insecurity for students, there were several staff members who asked, Well, what about food insecurity for staff? And my response at the time was, Well, you know, I don't, I there, as far as I know, there's not a study, um, so we can have anecdotal data, but um, perhaps we can encourage a study. And then I found out that there was research happening and there's there's data so um, that'll be an interesting conversation I will say that last year one of the things that we were told would be on the agenda before Jason came um, was compensation for staff so 
Yeah. <laughs> I, I believe they're related. <laughs> As do I, and we haven't had a chance to talk about it, so she's hearing something for the first time from me, which is that I think compensation is the answer to that. That where it differs with our responsibility to students, our responsibility because they come into our care. But with employees, I believe that it's we should compensate employees to be able to live. So I think that that's the way we solve it. Food insecurity when it comes to staff. Uh, and I think the solution is different than it should be for students. It's only one great. last question. Okay, so um, the last Sam, you can ask another question. <laughs> staff readings, uh, do, do you, you haven't been there that long, but did they have anything to do with UCLA coming up with a non smoking policy that's not real? Uh, most of the other campuses, most of the other campuses have policies. All of a sudden, UCLA jumps on the bandwagon. Building managers are told, you know, you need to enforce it, but there's no teeth behind it. And I was promised three years ago there were going to be banners all over campus. Like if you go to other campuses, you see it said we're a no smoking campus. Where do you see that at UCLA? What happened to the not wellness? What happened to the non smoking policy on campus? It's an academic senate shoved under a table somewhere and they're not talking about it anymore. And it's driving us crazy because we're still expected as building managers to make sure that if people are smoking around our buildings that we say something, but we have nothing to back us up. I will say that, and I will turn That's over to exactly what I was going to say, that you know, it says no smoking. There, there are signs, there are signs but there's just nothing to enforce the smoke no smoking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it, it, was, it was a hotly debated topic on our campus as well. Our chancellor was very passionate about moving forward with it, but when it came down to it, the question of enforcement came up, and uh, our police chief, who was on the work group, was like, we're a police force. We're here to protect and serve the community. And if somebody is smoking, that's not going to be our first call. Right. We're going to go save someone's life. So it's, I don't think, it, it, it has to be a cultural shift. And it's not easy. It's when we have international students, that are used to smoking anywhere, everywhere inside. Yeah. I mean, just getting them to smoke outside is a job. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I mean, it is a significant cultural shift, and it is uh, the kind of leadership that you see should aspire to. But it's not an easy. There's no easy solution. To it. So I did want to say it's it's a system wide policy. So it's not like UCLA got to say. Oh yeah, we're going to adopt this policy. It was a system-wide policy, and campuses were given a time period within which to comply and put up signage and communicate that that was the system-wide policy. Because the University of California is a no-smoking system. Now, in terms of how things are enforced at the individual campuses, um, while we like to talk about leveraging the power of ten. Um, each individual campus has its own culture and policies and procedures and practices, even administrative structure. Um, in terms of specifically enforcing the tobacco policy, there, um, in addition to the police and you know their trying to what their their priorities are, the other part was the purpose of the um, tobacco-free policy was you know health benefits, <laughs> and um, I think. The discussion was that there would be kind of a phased approach in the sense that you know there would be communication, signage, and at some point it would you know progress to some degree of um, accountability, but that they didn't want to just um, make it a completely punitive policy or practice because it kind of gets away from the goal and then. Um, you know, smoking is, it, it's an addiction. And, you know, my understanding is addiction is a disease. Jen? I, I went to a recent meeting, of the, there's a whole subcommittee on smoke free on campus. So they're trying <laughs> out, so this is what they're doing. And there will be new signages coming out, they just approve new signage. So you'll start seeing even more, because I do see them on campus. 
Another part is to encourage all of us to be confident enough to approach smokers. Right now, a lot of feedback is like you talk to them and then you kind of you don't have a badge, you don't have this. So there is an experiment by an uh, undergrad right now going around. They're going to be fake smoking. And then <laughs> and seeing if people actually accost them. And then really ask them, why didn't you talk to me about this? Why? <laughs> what prevented you? So then we're going to try to do, you know, the non smokers could really help because they're right outside my office every day. So like, like we're we're have a natural patio. And I go out there and go, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. And then, <laughs> and then sometimes there's a big group and I have to like text them. And then if I get a fight, I guess I'll come out. I also have to be on the text. Uh, but, so that's one component of it. Another component is, they're looking at, you know, up until uh, somebody got hit, a vice chancellor on a bike, this is all dismount zone now. So instead of charging the UCPD, giving people a ticket, they want to send them to driving school. So then, they're really looking, exploring that concept as well, right? We don't really want, our students are already paying a lot of tuition, they can't pay, we're gonna add more fees, <laughs> right? So basically, maybe have them go do some kind of training, so they never go, watch video, some kind, and then say, look, if you go to traffic school, you don't have to pay. So then they're kind of taking that concept and applying to smoking. So hopefully some of this new new initiative will out soon in the next six months. Hopefully we'll see something. But the signs are definitely there around the turnaround. There's a sign at every single lamp post. And then you're right, Albert, I think the smoke right underneath. <laughs> so where is it over by my building? Where's your building? There's one sign next to Humanities. Little tiny sign on the light. Yeah, it's a, yeah because that's it. Like and somebody there. wrote on it or put a sticker on it, and I just saw it's like a sticker on top of the no smoking sign. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for the North Camp. There you go. But anyway. But okay, good. Yeah, so like the smoking police. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out today. This, these are um, really good questions, really good feedback. And um, Moana and Jason have uh, provided all of us with their email address so please feel free to direct additional comments or questions to them and thank you all for coming and thank you